Amanda Scott from Peace Within Living Magazine. I'm here at Churn Park at the Soul Point Holistic Centre with um, Peter Williams, a world-renowned medium who travels the world sharing his work to enlighten others about their loved ones. In his studio he has readings here when you can catch him. Uh, he's a wonderful man sharing his story for when he started his new age experience at the age of 14 and later started tarot cards um, around 17, followed over to um, Japan to travel to teach English to the Japanese. Thinking he had a teaching background, it's actually opened up so many more opportunities for him. So we're going to hear about his wonderful inspirational story. Hope you enjoy. To be honest, it was um, not the usual kind of opening. Um, I think a lot of people say, you know, they had the uh, spirits around when they were two or three or a bit younger. Um, look, possibly they, they might have been around me at that time, they most likely were, but uh, I wasn't open to it um, or wasn't aware of it, I, just, I should say. But, uh, but at 14, I went looking for it. Um, don't ask me why. Um, I just did. And uh, yeah, so I just uh, went on the internet. I found a, um, a website called uh, crystallinks.com and it's still there, believe it or not, all these years later. And um, yeah, I found an exercise uh, on automatic writing and that night uh, at very wee hours of the morning, I tried it and yeah, it worked. So it was just, Incredible. yeah, it's just one of those things. And then since then, it's just uh, kind of gone from strength to strength to strength. Well, with your family though, were your parents, did they sort of have any knowing inside or your brothers and sisters, did, were they sort of have a... Similar sort of awareness? Realistically, no. Um, I was had to really figure this out on my own. Um, I was pretty open about it though. Like, so that first night that I did it, I was super excited and I came out and told my sister and my mum. Um, but they were kind of like, oh, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, like, I, the way my mum was looking at me was thinking, hopefully this might pass you know <laughs> so it was just one of those things that was kind of but um but i've just kind of kept going with it um dad? Has he received it well? took a long time um my dad's probably really only come to probably understand it and uh not necessarily pretty but understand it and accepting of it uh probably more so in the last what two or three years okay. um you know after his own little personal experience really yes yeah so um yeah like he was i think yeah he's a very uh logical mind like so he's an engineer mm -hmm. so very different mind mm -hmm. yeah so working with that and it's hard like uh, also a generation and cultural difference like he grew up you know support your family get a good job all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and uh here i am you know in the 2000s kind of it is discover what you want, discover who you want, you know, to be and all that kind of thing. So it's uh, just been a little bit different in that way. And your brothers and sisters, they've sort of all got diverse different sort of roles um, in their career paths? Yes, um, yeah, well, my sister was a uh, yeah, designer and uh, buyer for um, a local rug company, uh, quite, a, quite a big rug company, so she's, she's done that, but she's now mum, <laughs> so she's having a mum. Uh, I've got three brothers, um, uh, my one up from me, uh, Adam, he's now in Dubai because he, he works with uh, aircraft as well because that's my, that's my family legacy is, is uh, aeroplanes and airlines. Um, yeah, and then my other brother's accounting and uh, my other uh, brother's uh, in logistics. So it's a very, very diverse family. Totally. <laughs> yes. And what happened after you started to delve into um, the writing after that? What sort of flowed? I guess at 17 you, you opened you found your tarot cards and started to become more aware from that. Um, what were the trials and tribulations around, you know, opening up to your spirituality for you? Uh, I think the biggest thing, like, so I had to do a lot of it myself. Mm -hmm. um, probably one of the biggest trials was, like, who do you talk to? Um, naturally going through high school, like it's not a good thing to kind of open up and say, hey, you know, I see things and, you know, I read tarot cards and stuff like that. So let's just say I think I was astute enough not to say anything <laughs> to anybody at the time. So I kept it under wraps. Uh, my close friends were, uh, I let know, but, um, but then it was just at that point, um, yeah, got into the tarot and it was just about, yeah, who to talk to, where to go for more knowledge because doing it by yourself 
is, is hard. Yeah, it's is, very shocking, very, very hard. Yeah, it's really, really hard. And who do you ask if, if mm. what you're doing is right or what you're seeing is good? Or it's, it was just, that was the hard part, yeah. So, and then I was just fortunate, um, I think it was around the age of uh, 17, 18, that's when I uh, actually met my mentor. Oh, wonderful. And she was lovely and she just, she knew straight away. And she said, look, if you ever need it, like we actually had a reading with her yeah. and she, she recognised it straight away. Yeah. And she said, if you need a helping hand, she goes, I have an open house policy every Tuesday night. Oh, how beautiful. And um, your yes, yeah, very much so, very much so. the right people come in at the right time, don't they? They always say that. Well, it's the Buddhist saying, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when, when the student is ready, yeah. the teacher will appear. Yeah. And I honestly believe I was. Yeah. Um, I stuck with it enough. Yeah. Uh, I had a little bit more understanding and belief in myself, yeah. but I just needed that guidance. That yeah, like from this side. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And was it, um, did you have any really bizarre experiences, you know, around that time of when you were learning? And I guess even now, when you have spirits come in, um, how do you learn to be able to shut off? You know, um, how do you sort of be able to have your time out? Um, that is, it's a common question that a lot of people ask me now. It's like, oh, how do you switch off? Mm -hmm. But I've, I have to admit, I've been very, very lucky because I've just always been able to do it. Mm -hmm. So I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. There have been occasions when, uh, let's just say, spirit have pushed the boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, one instance in particular, was with my mentor one night uh, and she was not feeling very well and uh, I know she had a chest infection yeah. and I just very naively I will admit uh, did a little bit of healing on her so a little bit of Reiki because I picked up on that and you know again hadn't studied because 17 but and I just did this and I was like yeah and she said oh thank you I felt better however I didn't realize by the time I got home, and it was really interesting, my family had family friends over, and we're all sitting around the table, everybody's happy and drinking, and I get home, and all of a sudden, I just felt, boom. I felt so flat, I felt I didn't feel good, it was almost like feverish in a little bit, yeah. and I said, oh look, I'm really sorry, I'm going straight to bed. So I did, and then all of a sudden, I just started coughing, and I was like, <laughs> in a very, like, it was just really unusual. Yeah. Didn't feel good, so I thought, I need to meditate. I just need to calm down. And so I did, and in that process, all I remember is I saw these pair of hands, literally, like, as I was laying there on my bed, these pair of hands just came out. That's all I saw was a pair of hands, and they came into my chest. And, like, it's like, and it's just kind of weird. And there's this beautiful, like, oh, serene female voice just said, this is not your burden to bear and just reached in and literally pulled and I actually pulled up up off the bed and like it just pulled whatever was inside and then I collapsed on the bed and fell asleep and I, I remember I woke up eight nine hours later in the exact same position I fell asleep in best night's sleep I've ever had <laughs> um, but at the same time very freaky experience yeah. it, it taught me a lot to to trust in spirits around you that will help you but it also taught me to be very careful about energy and energy exchange. Yeah. Um, so that was a very early learning curve. Um, yeah, so I didn't realise I actually had taken on, um, you know, uh, my mentor's illness yeah. at that point in time. So that was just a bit, yeah. bit naive of me. <laughs> so yeah. Um, how did you enjoy Japan? What was the experience you had over there? So Japan, I did an exchange in Japan when I was 14. So yeah. there's a link in itself, um, which uh, I haven't realised until like, you, know, you start putting the dots together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's now, I've realised there's a link there. Yeah. Uh, it was my original intention, oh, okay, I'll go back to Japan because I kind of know the place, but it's a different culture, I want to experience this, mm -hmm. so it was good. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like literally, yeah, I just, I was there going, hey, wow, it's like, it's almost like I'm a free man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but it was, it's like, you know, it's a whole new world, and uh, it was just exciting. Um, but at the time, like it was, I think the biggest thing for me about Japan at that point mm. was I could really be who I needed to be. I could be me. And what people don't understand is like all through my teenage years, I and mean, even with my family, I had to keep that side of myself kind of hidden away. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this thing kind of, I don't know, it was like a, a release or a freedom. Mm -hmm. And so in Japan, I was like, 
I meet you for the first time, guess what? This is what I do. Um, and, that, <laughs> and it's like, it freaked a few people out. But it was really nice because then all of a sudden, I had a whole group of friends around me who knew this about me so I could actually talk openly and freely about it without anybody worrying about it. Yeah. Be yourself, be natural. And it was great. And then if they didn't like it, they'd go, I'm not going to be your friend. And it's like, perfect. <laughs> so I, that was, and that. Protecting who you needed to, yeah. And like, that's, I needed that. Yeah. Um, and that was the best part about it. And that's, like, Japan was, uh, it was, it was a, like a, the floodgates opening. It was, I needed it. That core to keep you really strong, isn't it, almost as well? It's like that strengthening when you've got that support network there of yes. friends and being respected for who you are and not being judged. Yes. It's everything, you know, to be able to do what you love and you know, follow your purpose. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, at the time, I'll admit, it, I wouldn't say like it was something I loved, but it's just something I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, to me, it was a hobby. Um, so it was yeah. like, you know, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but I, like, as time went on, like, you know, naturally from 17 to, to 21, I realised how much I did like it. Mm -hmm. um, but by no means, you know, even until 28, I never, ever thought of this as a career mm -hmm. or a job, yeah. ever. So what were you doing in Japan then, in those sort of years, um, apart from teaching you doing other... No, just, it was pretty much just teaching. Okay. So, um, yeah, teaching English... And then um, lived a little bit in China as well in Hong Kong. So, but um, but it was yeah. I was just focusing on uh, teaching. I also studied, so I really enjoyed my teaching. I wanted to be a teacher since I was like, oh, what age was twelve? Um, so and then I thought, okay, go in. So I studied my linguistics and I studied Japanese at university and all that kind of stuff. So to build up on that, and so, yeah, so teaching. It's funny, as, as we had a quick chat about before, it's like I thought teaching was going to be my path. Yeah. Um, but I know now it still is, yeah. just in a very, very different way. So obviously when you're in Japan, do you, you, uh, come across, do you get to meet your love of your life? Um, yes, yes. Um, and it was uh, very interesting because it happened very quickly. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of nice too, because uh, even now with people, because uh, as most people know, when they go for a reading, it's a very common question. It's like, when am I going to meet the right person for my love life? Um, and they, you know, and it's actually kind of nice because a few clients we have a bit of a running joke about that. It's like you probably haven't heard this one before, you know. Um, but no, I was very. But the way I look at it and the way I see it was, I was really in my element and I was being me, and I was more focused on me and being happy within myself. And I think that I look back on it, and that was just the natural attraction factor uh, doing that. So within yeah, within three months, I actually met yeah uh, Kanako. So and she yeah, she's love my life. She's the connection. Um, and it's like yeah, so it was like three months in, and then that was it. It's like I was yeah. And does she have a spiritual connection, or what's sort of her background as well? Um, no. Well, funny thing is, uh, airlines. <laughs> <laughs> even, even even though she's like she's very happy to leave that behind, um, but it was, yeah, it's just I'm thinking, what's the chances of me meeting a, a woman like in in a very small part of Japan, and she happens to work for Japan Airlines? <laughs> and um, but yeah, she didn't really have um, a spiritual connection, like you know, in terms of uh, actively doing it. Yeah. Um, but through the time of working with me, she's come to understand a lot more mm -hmm. she appreciates a lot more and she can see like she enjoys helping people mm -hmm. the way that she can whether yeah. through because we um obviously with the japanese readings because i channel in english so she translates for me because it's just easier oh, wonderful. yeah so you offer that as well. yes yeah so that's how we that's how we do that japan side of things Perfect. yeah uh, and so you're doing quite a lot in Japan. What's your sort of, you're doing a lot of travelling with your work now. It's sort of quite diverse. Yeah, well, um, it was, Japan was like, it was the opening of uh, this work. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I look back on it now and it's like, you know, in Japan, I actually had my first paid reading. So that was kind of like, and I had, it was really nice because I had some very close friends that said, look, you are really good. Mm -hmm. You should really be charging for this, but I didn't ever want to charge. Yeah. Um, but eventually, I, up, I just asked for a donation, and, and it was like my first paid reading. So I was like, oh, wow, like it was another kind of level up, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And um, there from there, it just kind of word of mouth, it just grew uh, very quickly. Yeah. 
and so you know I was teaching pretty much during the week and on weekends <laughs> my wife and I were reading <laughs> and um, so it would just it kind of grew and then like my first business card was in Japanese so and you know we had the uh, you know earthquake and stuff in between but we've still got a strong connection and we've kind of gone back to reconnect with the, the dots so to speak right. um, and yeah we're doing a lot lot more now so and connecting with a lot of different people. So when you had the earthquake and the tsunami and I guess with your gifts as well did you have any awareness that or like, sense that something was happening at the time? No. no. Um, I was again I think I was very focused in my logical mind at that point in time yeah. um, so at that time mm -hmm. I think about six seven months prior we, we literally opened up our own English school oh. so we were very busy building business yeah. getting clients or students and um, even though I was doing readings, but um, now that, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. but there's a, there was a few little telltale signs that but I would never have picked up on. Mm -hmm. Now, I simply look at it as I was a part of this process. If I had a known, yeah, I could have gotten out, but mm -hmm. I think because it was part of my destiny yeah. um, or my path, I couldn't know about it. Yeah. I had to go through it very naturally, it. yeah. yeah. So, because I remember uh, I had one client and he was um, a, quite a wealthy businessman and he was coming to me saying, oh, I'm usually in construction and, and this kind of work. And he goes, but it's not, not happening at the moment. He goes, I'm thinking about importing like magnesium from China and this, this and this. And I very vividly remember saying to him, I said, nothing to do with China. I said, your business is going to be construction. I said, I know this sounds really weird. I don't know how and I don't know why. I said, but you're going to be building highways and roads. And he's like, I said, he goes, but everything's been built. I'm like, I know. I said, but all I keep seeing is they keep showing me the highways and the roads. Mm -hmm. And naturally, like, I think that was, again, probably close to a year later, Everything's destroyed and everything had to be rebuilt. And he was very, very busy doing construction and his usual job. So you, yeah. little things like that. I did receive one interesting uh, question from a client because they said there was a couple of people from overseas that popped in mm -hmm. and said that the power plant was on very negative ground and it's, it's, there's something going on there and they needed to, they wanted a lot of people to come and pray to uh, appeal the ley lines. Um, at the time, but that was a, like two years out. So, it's, yeah. but again, you know, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's hard to fathom. Like the other thing too is, like, granted, like they were talking specifically about that power plant, but yeah. Japan's got a lot of power plants. <laughs> yeah. So it was just like you know, and I kind of said, look, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, yeah. and it did. Yeah. So yeah, so no real warning signs as such, yeah. but you know, like I said, hindsight's a wonderful and your thing. Family or, um, your wife's family are all fine over there. Yes. Very lucky, yeah. So they're, they're still there. Um, we still have a house there. Like, so we still have roots right. and connection to that, yeah. So. And then was it long before or after that happened that it changed things for you? Um, so after the earthquake? After the earthquake, yeah. It was five days. Really? Yeah. Five days. We had to make a decision within five days yeah. Yeah. about what we were doing. Um, our house is very, very close to that power plant. It's only 60 kilometres away. Um, the evacuation zone was... 30. My workplace, which I now very well know, was 31 kilometres away because after I went back in August, uh, they made me go back to work because I was one kilometre away from that. Yeah, so even though in my head I'm like, uh, radiation doesn't exactly obey <laughs> an invisible line. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Um, but so, but yeah, it was just, uh, it was just, but you know, that's J Japan, like, you know, we've got these rules in place, yeah. this is what we need yeah. to do. So you have to kind of, yeah, work with that. Um, but yeah, five days, we, because at the time my wife was 37 weeks pregnant with our first child. So it was like decision time. And when you're watching the TV 24 seven about, is this nuclear power plant going to blow up or not? So we just decided to make the move and said, well, we'll go back to Australia. Well, to be honest, like even at the time, I remember talking about it and like her parents were there and we're talking about how is this going to work? You know, yeah. if you go back, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, because my whole career is English teaching and my degree is geared towards that. And like English teaching here doesn't, you know, it's not a great career. And I remember the mining boom. And I was like, I'll go and work in the mines. I'll go and work in the mines. And so, you know, that's what I thought. It's like, you know, they're paying really well. And I knew friends in the mines. I thought, we'll just do that. 
wasn't meant to be. No. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly wasn't meant to be. No. So, and look, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm, I do the paperwork, but I wouldn't be out there, you know, shoveling the coal. That's just me. I'll, I'll admit to that. I'll own up to that one. <laughs> And the other thing, I guess, where do you see everything going now? There's a lot of growth going around you. You've got a few different directions. So, you know, where do, where's your vision for the future? Vision for the future, um, so uh, definitely doing a lot more uh, within Australia and really spreading the wings within Australia and New Zealand. Um, so we've got uh, Proserpine uh, at the end of this month, so going up there and doing that. Um, we've got other prospects with uh, Northern Territory, New Zealand and uh, other, other states, uh, but I've also um, Japan. So I've got Japan and Hong Kong kind of working them and got some big things coming that way as well. So yeah, it's getting. Yes, I am doing a book. Um, so I've, I've given myself a little bit of uh, what do they call it? Um, I've lost the word. A little bit of um, accountability. Yeah, That's what I'm looking for. Yes. So otherwise, it just slips by, slips no. by. So, but um, but yeah, it's coming, and um, I'm hopefully that will be uh, launched mid next year. So that will be released. So. Well, I look forward to hearing that. We'll share more of that in the, um, the magazine as well and spread the word for you. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm yeah. really, really grateful and thankful for your time today. It's been wonderful meeting you. Yeah, thank you. And very dynamic human being. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I wish you all well. Thank you very much. Thank you.